Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Donna Dimitrovic, and I'm the director of the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention. I'd like to welcome you today to today's kickoff event for National Prevention Week. Well, this is my first National Prevention Week as the CSAP director. This year, SAMHSA marks the 10th anniversary of National Prevention Week. I'm speaking to you today as a grandmother, a person in long-term recovery, and a family member supporting addiction recovery. And I'm a firm believer in the power of prevention. We know that opportunities for prevention exist at every level, from strengthening individual knowledge and skills, to promoting community education, to fostering coalitions and networks, mobilizing neighborhoods and communities, to changing internal practices and policies of agencies and institutions, and to influencing policy and legislation. National Prevention Week is our time to shine the spotlight on your efforts to delay the initial use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and to prevent substance misuse in order to promote healthy behaviors. And as most of you know, I'm a firm believer that all of the work that's happening actually happens in the community. So, you know, thank you every, for all that you do every day. Today, you will learn what's new for National Prevention Week 2021. We will also hear from SAMHSA's Acting Assistant Secretary for Mental Health and Substance Use, Tom Kader, who will close out our program by offering SAMHSA's prevention vision and highlighting some of the outstanding hashtag youth leading prevention video submissions. We will learn from two different programs who are putting prevention into action. Specifically, we will hear from Leslie Gable, a certified prevention specialist from Prevention Resources in New Jersey, and Dallas Wapipa, a Native Connections grantee from the Native American Health Center in San Francisco. Both of our grantees will highlight some of their youth-led prevention efforts in their communities. And we will also hear about resources that are available from SAMHSA. Prevention of substance use disorders requires all of us, not only those of us in the prevention sector. Our colleagues in the intervention, treatment, enforcement, and research sectors all play important and complementary roles. It's not always easy, but effective collaborations and partnerships are essential to ensuring the good health and well being of our nation's children, families, and communities. I'd now like to turn it over to David Wilson, our NPW coordinator. He will walk you through the details of National Prevention Week 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. And more importantly, thank you for your leadership and your full support of National Prevention Week. I've been the coordinator of National Prevention Week, or NPW, since its inception, and we here at SAMHSA are thrilled to be highlighting the 10th anniversary of NPW. Each and every year has seen an increase in participation from communities and organizations across the country. And that wouldn't have been possible without the vision and support of past and current SAMHSA CSAP leadership. As we are kicking off National Prevention Week, the main resource engine behind NPW is our website. So I encourage everyone to visit www.samhsa.gov forward slash prevention hyphen week to be introduced to the many ways of getting involved with the observance. And not just during the week itself, but throughout the entire year because prevention happens every day. We just use this week as a platform to showcase what effective prevention efforts look like throughout the year. And NPW does that through our three main goals. One, to involve communities in raising awareness of behavioral health issues, and not just raising awareness, but by showcasing their effective prevention efforts as well. Two, to foster partnerships and collaborations with with federal and national organizations who are dedicated to behavioral health, just like we are. And lastly, to promote and disseminate quality resources, data, and publications to assist those communities who are doing the work on the ground. So this year, like in past years, we are asking individuals, community-based organizations, and coalitions to showcase their efforts around these five daily health themes. 
preventing prescription drug and opioid misuse, preventing underage drinking and alcohol misuse, preventing illicit drug use and youth marijuana use, preventing youth tobacco use with a special emphasis on e-cigarettes and vaping. And we wouldn't be the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration if we weren't trying to focus our efforts on preventing suicide. So as I close, here are a few ways that you can get involved or support MPW. This year, programs around the country participated in the hashtag Youth Leading Prevention Video Challenge. And even though our deadline has closed for submissions to display in this program, you can still get involved in the challenge and tag others to participate. You can also raise awareness and engagement in MPW by featuring MPW content on your website and in your newsletters. You can host or participate in, in virtual MPW events and activities in your communities. And lastly, you can share MPW updates and activities through your social media channels using hashtag MPW2021. And now I'd like to turn it over to Captain Josephine Haynes Battle, who's the director of CSAP's Division of Systems Development and a SAMHSA Senior Commission Corps Nurse Officer. She will introduce our two prevention grantees, and then she will close with a brief presentation of selected SAMHSA prevention resources. Thanks very much, David. As promised by Center Director Dimitrovic, it is now time to put the spotlight on two of SAMHSA's grantees who will highlight some of their exciting youth-led prevention efforts in their communities. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce you now to our first grantee, Ms. Leslie Gable. Leslie is a certified prevention specialist and the co-chief executive officer at Prevention Resources, which is a nonprofit agency presently covering Hunterdon, Somerset, Monmouth counties in New Jersey. Leslie graduated with a marketing degree from Hofstra University. She has over 30 years experience in key leadership roles in nonprofit management and training with a focus on statistical analysis, auditing and process improvements. Ms. Gable joined the prevention resource team in 2009 to direct and manage the Federal Drug-Free Communities Grant Program, focusing on reducing underage drinking and drug misuse through the Safe Communities Coalition. The coalition has been recognized several times nationally for its outstanding successes and demonstrated outcomes in the area of prescription drug prevention and the reduction of underage drinking and marijuana. Leslie and her team have received multiple awards. Ms. Gable is passionate about creating a better community by being involved with many organizations. So without further ado, Leslie. Our coalition serves Hunterdon County, New Jersey, a population of 124,000 people in an incredibly beautiful and quiet suburban rural living. We are located about an hour west of New York City and an hour northeast of Philadelphia. The county is remarkably diverse with farmlands, small municipalities, and towns covering 347 square miles. Our community has seen a very high rates of opiate overdose deaths, surpassing auto accidents, and it has grown each year. The cost of heroin locally is between $3 and $5 for a glassine bag. Pills range anywhere from $8 to $18. Technology has impacted substance use the most in our county, creating a significant increase in availability. I have the great privilege today of highlighting some of the incredible work of the Safe Communities Coalition. Challenges, like most coalitions, is reaching parents and youth annually. The, our solution was we created Teen Safety Nights which is an incredible event that happens every year. We collaborate with the third largest high school in the state of New Jersey of Hunter and Central that's located right in the center of our county. It's a uh, sustainable policy change. It requires juniors and their parents to attend an educational event on current drug issues in order to be eligible for a parking privilege for the following year, which is much sought out for students. Annual attendance is around 1,100 Students and parents, on average, we have seen 96 to 98 percent increase in perception of harm and knowledge, 90 percent increase of knowledge of medicine drop boxes. Our youth coalition has presented to their peers as well as collect data. 
As parents are arrived, we actually have our youth coalition ask them a four question survey. The survey focuses on knowledge of RX storage and disposal, as well as laws around underage drinking. We use this data to track the effectiveness of our strategies. Typically parents arrive with their teens. They're not so happy that they have to attend but appreciate it upon leaving. We've reached over 12,000 parents and teens since 2012. The importance of collecting this data and, and having our youth collect it is we found that we thought we were doing such a great job with the number of drop-off boxes. But what we found is that when we gathered this data that a lot of people weren't using it. So it's a great way and important to collect data to ensure your strategies are being effective. So we had to change our strategies. The problem we had with teens did not believe that there were consequences for underage drinking, marijuana, pill use, Law enforcement at the same time did not want to give teens a permanent record. So our teens really didn't believe there were any consequences. To address this issue, our coalition worked with the prosecutor's office, prevention resources, and law enforcement to create a program called LEAP, which stands for Law Enforcement Adolescence Program. LEAP is an early intervention program for our youth with the overall goal of providing diversion from entering the legal system and from reoffending. Services provided through LEAP include individual counseling, youth community service hours, parent counseling, parent programs, substance use assessment, short-term educational programs, all focusing on mental health and social well-being. If a law enforcement officer identifies a teen who they believe is high risk, based on their arrest, they have the option to divert them into our LEAP program rather than further involve them in the legal system in order to get them the help that they may need. As part of community services, we have them work with our teens as part of our youth coalition and at community events, as well as they have to watch our documentaries, which I'll be speaking about coming up next. The most important aspect is we know that this program works. As we track our teens throughout their adolescent years and beyond, we know that 98% of the teens have not reoffended again. Very successful. During our community assessment, one prevalent environmental condition identified as contributing to youth opioid problems in Hunterdon County is the availability and easy access of prescription drugs and heroin. Perception is that it's okay to share pills since they are prescribed by a doctor. There is little education in the home of the harmful effects of prescription drugs as well as, the, as leading to heroin use. Our solution was to create a documentary collaborating with the prosecutor's office, comprised of local stories and a call for action of safe storage and disposal. I'd like to share you a quick clip uh, that highlights the film that was picked up by uh, CBS News. A new weapon in the war on drugs, teenagers learning about the problem from recovering addicts who are young enough to be their peers. CBS 2's Christine Sloan with the film on the dangers of being hooked on heroin. It's really easy to get drugs. We started using mushrooms, you know, acid, oxycontin. Heartbreaking stories from recovering drug addicts. My family members were robbed of my time, my love, and their parents. You know, the person I once knew, the sweet girl that I, you know, that I, I raised when she was ten, when she lost her parents. Um, you know, really. Um, Try to say, like, isn't my love enough to make you stop? The film is called Pills to Heroin. It's being shown in some New Jersey high schools. The message, heroin addiction can start with prescription pill abuse. These pills are a, a prescription heroin. It is the same region of the brain as far as how addictions occur. So we were incredibly fortunate that CBS News picked up our uh, highlights of our documentary. Great success we've had with the film, significant RX disposal following our launch, an increased perception of harm, and most important, decrease of 30-day use of prescription drugs. To create sustainability, we work with our local, local legislator, the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and the New Jersey Board of Education to ensure that our film was an approved resource for all schools and colleges in New Jersey. Additionally, it's mandated for all youth in the LEAP program to watch the film as well as write about the impact. The ever-changing landscape of the opiate crisis in our community has been difficult. In listening to our youth coalition, while most were learning about heroin in school curriculums, they were not very familiar with fentanyl. Most of our community could not understand why we're still losing so many people to overdoses. We created the fentanyl factor last year. Similar to our pills to heroin, we had talked with experts about, the fet about fentanyl, as well as local stories from parents that had lost their child. 
Before launching the film, we had our youth coalition screen what we thought, just like our Pills to Heroin documentary, would reach our teens. Their feedback was critical as we missed some important aspects. Teens wanted to hear more from other teens and not just parents and law enforcement. So we had to go back and redo our interviews. Our launch last year was through several town hall events. Uh, we were fortunate to be able to get one in-person launch last January and the rest have been virtual. We've already seen a significant increase in knowledge and resources based on pre and post surveys. Most importantly, this is another sustainable tool that our schools can use and it's been improved throughout to be able to use uh, statewide and they're all free, free access as well as on our website. One of the biggest problems that we have had is we've always wanted an app. And when we researched trying to find an app, it cost, would cost us up to over $10,000. So we basically were never able to do so. We were, we were meeting with our local high school media club and code club, and we had great partnerships and they were working on some mini public service announcements for us. So they asked us if we had anything else that we wanted to do. So I threw in there, hey, we would love an app, you know, to connect teens to all local resources as well as state and national. I never thought it would happen. Months later, they reached out. These kids taught themselves how to use um, codes and be able to create this app for us. I'm gonna be able just to take you through some of the different parts of our, our app. So this is the front page. It talks about the Overdose Protection Act, which is incredibly important, as well as being able to click to different hotlines. Here you're looking at the drug and alcohol. It also shows text. The blue areas is websites that they can reach out for anything that they may need help with. Other types of hotlines that come up is also, uh, excuse me, also for prescription take back. And so they can also see as well as their parents, all the different places as far as the help app. This help app uh, by, let's start again. This help app, we had designed it very differently. And the kids came back and said to us, we don't like the way your design looks. And we listened to what they said. They also came up with some other areas that, as far as mental health that they really wanted to make sure that it was covered. So what you're seeing here are the other categories they asked us to include. We provided them with the appropriate evidence-based information. They created the, the rest. An incredible policy change around this app is as you can see here, we have it in English and also in, in Spanish. When somebody's phone is set to translate into Spanish, when you go into our app, it actually changes everything into Spanish, which is an area in our county with language barriers so that was very important. Also about this app is we're working with our local police department and when they come across a team that they're concerned about, they have these cards that they can hand out. What we also uniquely did is we created these unique QR codes. So we can track from different, different places on who's downloading and who's getting connected to our resources. This was another area that we were really fortunate to, to work collaboratively together with our high school. As most of you, I'm sure, are having the same issues of dealing with vaping. So what we did is we decided that we needed to somehow connect our teens to resources and quit, quit Somehow we needed to get our teens connected to quit. Somehow we had to get our teens connected with quit resources. So we decided that we would do a take back event during the school day at, at our high school. What we did is Monday through Friday, we had lots of media campaigns going out about the dangers of vaping. We also had the same information sending back to parents while also telling the teens if they turn in their devices and any types of pods or any other types of electronic devices that we would uh, enter them in to win a free, um, we would enter them in to win free earbuds. Additionally, they would also be able to pick out gift cards. The gift cards we were giving out were Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts. We wanted to make sure that anything that they were turning in, they would not necessarily be able to repurchase the devices they were again, uh, sending over to us. We even had teens come in videotaping, showing their parents that they were turning it in. Uh, we did this two different times. The first time teens were very leery. They didn't really think that this was gonna be no questions asked. 
The second time we got a significant amount of vape materials that you see actually in the background, that, those are some of the devices that we got back. Most important is when they came into the hand, most important when they came in to hand in their devices, we gave them materials of how to quit, as well as said, any types of sensation materials that we were giving them, as well as free services by our agency. This last slide, we're incredibly proud of. Our youth coalition created training programs for adults. They actually helped pick out the topics that they felt adults really needed to learn. Look at the very top and the topic that these teens came out, active listening. Teens felt that parents really needed help with this. They've actually taught two classes to adults. They did the PowerPoints, they did the interactive games as well as the evaluations. You can see that pre and post test, they really help improve what they perceived adults need to know. All of the different information that I've covered today, you can find on our website. Please feel free to reach out to our coalition if you have any questions and would like to share more. I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity of speaking with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, for this wonderful presentation, but more importantly, for the impact on your community and the people you serve. Now we're turning to our second grantee, Mr. Dallas Wapipa, represents the Kikapu, Sark, and Fox tribe, who is one of SAMHSA's Native Connections grantee and serves as the program manager of the Transitional Aged Youth Program at the Native American Health Center. The Native American Health Center Native Connections Program provides American Indian Alaska Native tra tra uh, Transitional Aged Youth Services in the San Francisco Bay Area community, which include workforce development, events, ongoing cultural prevention services, mental health prevention and intervention services. Dallas has worked with youth for over 15 years in different capacities, including group facilitator, mentor, and youth worker. Growing up in the Bay Area community fuels his passion to create safe spaces for Native youth to explore their cultural identity and all aspects of themselves. Dallas' presentation will address successes and lessons on pivoting services to maintain culturally appropriate youth-driven leadership program in a multi-tribal urban setting. Dallas is joined by Ariana Antoine Ramirez, who is the president of the Transitional Age Youth Council. Dallas? Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dallas Wapipa. Um, I am the program manager here at the Native American Health Center for the Native Connections Program, uh, which is funded through SAMHSA. And uh, just like was, was mentioned earlier, um, our program uh, serves American Indian, Alaska Native transitional age youth uh, throughout San Francisco Bay Area community. Uh, we're currently in our uh, year five of a five-year grant. Um, so this is our final year. And um, our primary location is, uh, site is located at 160 Cap Street, San Francisco. So our vision statement was created in the planning year of Native Connections uh, that we did with our community. And uh, it goes, and I quote, our vision is to provide accessible services to American Indian, Alaska Native, transitional age youth, support their seamless transition into adulthood and provide a stable ground to, to fulfill their aspirations and dreams through embracing a healthy way of life and native values. So for today's presentation, um, I'm gonna be discussing our youth-led programs. And uh, so we'll be covering our uh, program internship, also known as the mentorship program. We'll be discussing the suicide prevention media program. And then finally, at la lastly, we'll be discussing the San Francisco Intertribal Unity Council, which is our Transitional Age Youth Council. So our mentorship program uh, came about because we have a youth leadership program here at the Native American Health Center that's called uh, the Youth Fellowship, which is for high school youth ages 14 to 17 years old. But we didn't have anything for our older transitional age youth, that 18 to 24 range. Uh, which has been a gap in services uh, in the past. So we were really grateful to get the Native Connections grant. Um, so the, the mentorship program focuses on that 18 to 24 year old population. The focus of the mentorship program 
is to help support and foster healthy outlets, cultural awareness, education and career development with an outcome of lowering the risk factors of substance abuse and suicide for native transitional age youth. In collaboration with our external and internal grant partners, the program provides in-depth suicide prevention trainings, such as the uh, question, persuade and refer QPR training, educational and job readiness workshops, outreach trainings, job shadowing, and in the past we've had GONA workshops. Our mentorship program, um, like I mentioned earlier, is a workforce opportunity for our transitional age youth. And uh, right now, currently, our program interns are working on uh, finishing up our suicide prevention media campaign, uh, which includes a photo uh, book project. Um, and they are currently receiving um, training for from a, one of our staff here at the Native American Health Center to um, learn how to uh, do a broadcast on, at a local radio show, which is actually part of uh, helping us to promote awareness on uh, suicide prevention. And they'll also get the opportunity to talk about important issues and topics um, that they feel is important in our in the community, as well as be able to create a playlist. So we're super excited about that. Um, they're also currently helping assist with other tasks with our community wellness department, such as program planning, uh, creating flyers, outreach, and, and attending virtual meetings and trainings. And next, uh, I'd like to talk about our suicide prevention media campaign. Um, the implementation of a statewide suicide prevention media campaign uh, has been our primary vehicle to help promote awareness on the issue. Um, this is a collaborative effort between Native Connections and Native Youth Wellness Initiative grant. What we did is that we created um, an eight week program where youth were able to go out. Um, each week we would upload a different theme to our uh, social media sites. And some of the themes might be uh, like, what does community mean to you? Uh, what does uh, culture mean to you? So we would have different prompts, different questions to kind of help guide them and uh, youth uh, throughout the state would go out and take pictures and they would be able, uh, based on the themes and they could upload them and um, share like their stories of, of why they took those pictures. Uh, some of our, our contributing staff to the Suicide Prevention Media Campaign, uh, we have right here, so we have like some of our core staff up on the top. Then we have our program interns. And then our youth fellows also helped as well with the, with the suicide prevention media campaign. So throughout the uh, campaign, we, um, we had 29 youth uh, submitted 125 photos um, throughout those uh, eight weeks. And um, during the, the media campaign, we had th uh, three different events with expanded over, I believe 75 participants were reached. And in addition, we also hosted a uh, QPR training for youth where we had 12 participants. So this is just an example of one of our um, youth suicide prevention uh, photo voice project flyers for the theme. This one's actually week seven and um, kind of give you guys an idea of like what we would put out there to engage with the youth. Uh, so for this one, it's like themes uh, for this week was a silhouette and uh, doing like a, an art piece. And here are a couple of pictures uh, from our photo book that we just recently created. And um, we have stuff around uh, what is like culture mean to you? What is community? So it's some awesome, beautiful, beautiful work by the youth here. It's another example. And then uh, our last event, um, which we hosted uh, virtually um, was uh, called the interconnectedness event. And um, during the event, we had different uh, icebreakers, different energizers. Uh, we had guest speakers, a lot of like engaging activities around uh, different aspects of health. Um, and we also had uh, some raffle prizes and we highlighted all the different pictures from the photo, photo voice project. And it was, it was a great turnout. So now I'd like to pass it over to uh, Ariana, the, the president of our Transitional Age Youth Council, and she can uh, talk more about our, our, our youth council. Thank you. Hello, so the Transitional Age Youth Council, our name 
uh, is the San Francisco Intertribal Unity Council, SFIUC. Um, right now, our council is composed of native transitional age youth, ages 18 to 24. And of the council currently, most of us have aged up from uh, Native American Health Center Youth Services. So the majority of us were going to those services before coming to like the transitional age youth age range. Um, our council mission is to focus on these core areas, which is representing urban Native youth, promoting education, as well as leadership development, health and wellness, cultural awareness, and volunteering. So some of our council activities for in the last year, not including this past April, um, but like April last year to March, we hosted 35 meetings in total, and our council meetings did have to transition to a virtual platform when COVID-19 hit. Some of our recent activities have been helping with food boxes to the community, mentoring younger community members, hosting virtual events, and sending out holiday cards for community elders to help them in dealing with the isolation of COVID. Also, some of the challenges that we face is that the virtual setting has definitely impacted our attendance, so we're trying to um, jump that hurdle, but it is very difficult. Also, it's been hard to outreach to recruit new members because, um, because of COVID, we can't really go out and talk to a lot of new people and bring them in. But some of our successes have been that more of our age group is going to um, graduating high school, going to college, and then even going on to graduate college, which for Native American youth, that's a big deal for us. We have the lowest graduation rates of any ethnic group, so that's a big deal for us. Also, we've been able to maintain regular meetings despite battling the Zoom fatigue that everyone's having. Um, also, we've had a lot of community collaboration because the majority of our current members do actually work for community organizations, which includes San Francisco Indian Education Program, Friendship House Youth Program, and California Consortium for Urban Indian Health. So we have employees of all these organizations actually sitting on our council right now. Some of our future goals are to raise enough funds to send members to future unity conferences so we can network with other Native youth and just build our network. We also want to recruit more members as some of us will be aging out soon. We want to build capacity to host larger events and also build up our social media presence. Thank you. Thank you, Ari. Uh, yeah, so just kind of segue into that, uh, what Ari was discussing around challenges and, and uh, like solutions and successes. So overall, our overall programmings with Native Connections, um, and especially more currently with everything that's gone on with the pandemic, uh, you know, we've experienced a lot of community pa uh, members passing away, um, loneliness, despair. Um, there is a lot of Zoom fatigue as well. Um, also, like the no, not having no in-person events uh, gatherings due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic and restrictions has been a challenge. And uh, the lack of access to technology, um, there's still a lot of young people that don't have access to certain technology um, as well. Some of the creative solutions, uh, partnerships, like Ari mentioned, care packages for community members, um, telehealth services, wellness checks, and continuing our virtual programs, uh, as well as peer-to-peer -peer support, such as the youth councils, which I feel like has been a very uh, pivotal, important piece in terms of Native Connection programming. And also mixed media approaches to uh, promote awareness uh, has been really helpful, uh, such as the Photo Voice Project. And then some additional successes, uh, just youth graduating from school, just really championing our young people, uh, youth being more engaged in social justice activities and community work. And then lastly, we just listed some of our resources uh, that our program interns put together um, for uh, any of the participants that are, are interested. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, Dallas, and Ariana for sharing the exciting and innovative prevention activities in your communities and highlighting youth-driven prevention activities. Now I'd like to shift just a little bit and highlight some of SAMHSA's resources, such as the resources from the PTTCs. The mission of SAMHSA's Prevention Technology Transfer Center Network is to support the substance misuse workforce with training and technical assistance. Complementing the network's vast catalog of original resources, the PTTC network compiled resource pages specifically in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and building health equity and inclusion. And you can see links to these pages and the full resources catalog uh, in your chat box right next to me. Here you can see at a glance four additional key resources 
all of our resources are available on our SAMHSA store and are downloadable. You have the guide to SAMHSA strategic prevention framework. Second, we have the selecting best fit programs and practices, guidance for substance issue prevention pra uh, practitioners. Thirdly, we have focus on prevention, strategies and programs to prevent substance use. And lastly, we are especially excited to offer a brand new resource, the Prevention Core Competencies, which is a tool for state and community prevention practitioners. It offers direction to the prevention field, affecting staff development and career ladders and pipelines, and providing guidance for training programs and service delivery qualifications. These are the current prevention guides available from SAMHSA's Evidence-Based Practices Resource Center. The first one you see is the Substance Misuse Prevention for Young Adults. Secondly, Preventing Use of Marijuana, Focus on Women and Pregnancy. And lastly, Reducing Vaping Among Youth and Young Adults. Each guide describes relevant research findings, examines emerging and best practices, identifies knowledge gaps and implementation challenges, and offers useful resources. Our underage drinking prevention resources now include two new discussion guides to use with the College Drinking Prevention Perspectives videos. The videos highlight how college-focused prevention strategies were successfully implemented on campuses to reduce underage drinking and problem drinking. They provide an overview of key themes and strategies in each episode, as well as conversation starters to spark discussions within your college community about alcohol and encourages viewers to talk about ways they can leverage these strategies in their own community. In addition, we have added a suite of new data visualizations, which will bring trends from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health to light. Be prepared to have the difficult conversation highlights the core currents of alcohol use and marijuana use among youth ages 12 to 17. Getting ahead of a problem reinforces how many youth begin drinking every day. Prevent unsafe drinking behaviors on campus is intended for prevention professionals who work in a college or university setting. Looks at key trends regarding the prevalence of alcohol use among college students. Other resources include underage drinking, myths versus facts, alcohol effects on the brain or alcohol FX, a mobile app for educators and parents to use with middle school aged children, the sound of your voice video and talking with your college bound young adult about alcohol. Parent guide helps parents discuss alcohol avoidance strategies. Brand new, the after high school. Talking with your young adult about underage drinking expands on the topic to include tips for parents to talk to their young adult, whether they attend college or not. Also available on the StopAlcoholAbuse.gov website, you can find materials and resources for communities talk, prevent, uh, talk to prevent underage drinking. Here are some additional selected resources for teens, parents, and caregivers. Tips for Teens fact sheet series available in English and Spanish. These fact sheets contain concise and easy to read information regarding marijuana, opioids, steroids, tobacco, e-cigarettes, inhalants, methamphetamines, heroin, underage drinking, cocaine, HIV, hallucinogens, sedatives, and stimulants. The Keeping Youth Drug-Free Resource Guide is intended for parents and offers advice on keeping children substance-free. The SAMHSA's Get Connected Toolkit is linking older adults with resources on medication, alcohol, and mental health. It is designed for organizations that provide services to older adults. This toolkit offers information and materials to help understanding the issues associated with substance misuse and mental illness in older adults. Our popular Talk They Hear You campaign resources include some brand new materials, such as Talk They Hear You, television and radio PSAs and campaign soundtrack by your site. They address both underage drinking and other substance use, including vaping. Check SAMHSA's YouTube channel and download them via our website. We have print PSAs, print PSA flyers, postcards, wallet cards, 
window clings, and, and a partner toolkit flash drive. New brochures uh, specific to vaping, marijuana, and opioids, and the new Five Conversation Goals mini brochure. We also have a suite of student assistance resources for educators, which showcase the importance of student assistance, professionals, uh, school leaders, and families working together to support the needs of students who may be struggling with substance use, mental health, or school-related issues. The new community engagement resources also help partners promote and implement the campaign locally. We all make choices. When it comes to alcohol, kids make choices whether to drink or not. Bye, Dad. Bye-bye. Remember, I'm going to Alex's party tonight and sleeping over. Yeah, have fun. Hey, Em, have a seat for a second. Remind me about that party again. Alex is just and adults make choices whether to talk about it. That's true of parents and every other trusted adult in a kid's life. Kids want to know our expectations when it comes to alcohol and other drugs. They want guidance and honest answers to their questions. And it makes a difference when the message is consistent and part of everyday conversations. So talk with your kids and help lead them on a positive path. Because when you talk, they hear you. For more information about talking with your kids about underage use of alcohol and other drugs, visit underagedrinking.samhsa.gov. And now we are super excited to share that you are among the very first to learn about SAMHSA's new Talk They Hear You campaign mobile app, which helps parents and caregivers prepare for some of the most important conversations they may ever have with their kids. Let's watch the promotional video. Everyday moments are great times to talk with your kids about underage drinking and other drug use. Because talking early and often lets them know your expectations, reinforces your message over time, and promotes ongoing open dialogue instead of just one big talk. But what do you say? And how do you say it? The Talk They Hear You mobile app is your guide to get informed, be prepared, and take action to talk with your kids about underage drinking and other drug use. The app is designed for parents and other caregivers, educators, and community members who play important roles in children's lives, like coaches, faith leaders, and others. The app provides guidance for talking with kids in a range of situations so that you can be prepared to talk about underage drinking and other drug use when opportunities arise. For each different scenario, the app helps you set a goal and gives you suggestions for how to start the conversation with your child. And it also helps you anticipate what your kid might say when you bring up these subjects, helping you plan responses in advance to keep the conversation on track. When you're ready, the app lets you practice and record yourself so that you can review what you said and make adjustments if needed. Remember. Talking about underage drinking and other drug use works best when it happens naturally in everyday conversation, so practice several different situations. The app also puts additional resources at your fingertips, useful information about alcohol and other drugs, and how to help your child stay safe. So download the Talk They Hear You mobile app today from the App Store, Google Play, or Microsoft Store and see how easy it can be to talk with your kids about underage drinking and other drug use. Because when you talk, they hear you. We hope that these resources will help to assist in advancing your prevention efforts. Now I'd like to turn over the session to Mr. Tom Coder to share a few words. Tom? Hello, everyone. I'm pleased to close out today's National Prevention Week kickoff event. I may be the Acting Assistant Secretary at SAMHSA, but I'm also a person in long-term recovery. So it's an honor to bring my lived experience to leading our agency. SAMHSA is addressing behavioral health trends that have emerged as a result of the pandemic and has been given significant resources to help people with mental and substance use disorders. Recently, the administration released nearly 2.5 billion dollars in supplemental funding for state block grants to address the mental illness and substance use crises. 
This funding will help increase the availability of services for individuals and communities experiencing heightened emotional trauma and the exacerbation of existing mental illness and substance use issues, which have no doubt worsened during the pandemic. The pandemic's impact has been acutely felt by Black and Indigenous communities and people of color. COVID-19 has revealed stark disparities in access to care in these communities, specifically with regards to the lack of insurance, cultural and linguistically appropriate care, technology, and transportation. SAMHSA is empowered by the President's commitment to control the COVID-19 pandemic and its unintended consequences on mental health and substance use. Last month, the Biden-Harris administration released its drug policy priorities for its first year. The policy priorities take a bold approach to reducing overdoses and saving lives. The priorities are also a way to emphasize several cross-cutting facets of the overdose epidemic, namely by focusing on ensuring racial equity in drug policy and promoting harm reduction efforts. The priorities are expanding access to treatment, advancing racial equity issues, enhancing harm reduction efforts, reducing youth substance use, reducing the supply of illicit substances, advancing recovery ready workplaces, expanding the addiction workforce, and expanding access to recovery support services. And now to wrap up today's presentation, I'm pleased to unveil the top three entries from our hashtag youth leading prevention video challenge, as well as two additional submissions we'd like to share. All of these selections demonstrate youth prevention in action across the country. Thank you everyone for joining us today to kick off the 10th anniversary of National Prevention Week. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose. I choose to stay above the influence for my education. For my sports and my family. For football. To protect my future. To pursue my dream of becoming a lawyer. Because cheer is important to me. I stay above the influence because I can focus better in school and make a positive impact on the world. For my family and as well my passion in photography. So I can keep my focuses on my dream to be a great leader and focus on my archery. Because I want to have a strong mind and a strong body. To protect my future. To stay healthy and to stay safe. I stay above the influence to continue to pursue what I love. Because I'm an athlete and I don't want to damage my body. To spread positivity through my peers and to be a positive leader in my community. To focus on my extracurricular activities. Because as an advocate for You Matter at my high school, I believe in relying on a support system of friends and loved ones rather than turning to substance abuse. Because I want to be the best I can be for those I love. For my family and for my health. I'm a butter influence because of books and this ball. I don't need these anymore. Don't throw medication away in the trash can. And don't flush it down the toilet. If you do this, it could be hazardous and could harm the beautiful water here in Groton or someone you love. Keep it away from everyone and everything. How? Take it to the box. Bring down your unused medication to the Groton City Police Department or the Town of Groton Police Department. Just go to the lobby, find the medicine drop box, and throw away expired or unused medications 24-7. When opportunity knocks, take it to the box. For more information, visit grindprevents.org. And this is just a star Cause when I'm in the dark I feel so alone It's like I'm paralyzed Like I can't even run From my deepest fears Been going out for years And all it brings me tears I feel so stuck here
giving them enough for barely at all. If they only knew the things that I've done and I saw, will they take me how I am with my fears and my flaws? Uh, it's been a battle with the enemy. I am the answer, but I've also been the enemy. I get doubts thinking I just don't have any me. Locked in a prison in my mind and I'm holding the key. From my deepest fears, been going out for years. Now it brings me tears. I feel so stuck here. Prevention work is something that I'm interested in, and I really think I really enjoy making a difference in my community and in my school. It's been really great to feel like I have a voice and to advocate for something I'm passionate about. I enjoy learning about the community and get to meet new friends. My friends and my peers and I can uh, get together to try and um, make a change on something that we're all passionate about, um, something that we care about. That helps spread awareness around our county, things such as mental health awareness, alcohol, and even drugs, mainly to teens and then sometimes even to parents who are just informing them on what their teens are doing today. It gives me a chance to talk with my peers and make changes. And that's exactly what I wanted for my community to talk about and solve problems that were actually happening to teenagers all over the place. We will need all hands in to see positive change.